We are back for another season of Play It Forward. Our guest today is a popular household name, especially when it comes to parents and boys. She's written a bunch of books, graced the stage worldwide, and changed the lives of many parents and children. Today we are talking about valuing children for where they are at, the rays of anxiety in our kids, and returning to school. Welcome back to Play It Forward, the wicked, the wonderful Maggie Dent. So yeah, as an overview, we, get, we sent those questions through. It's about that um, school starting, boys. And what I've, like, the journey I'm going on at the moment is, like with the Australian Institute of Play, we're doing a lot of children's voice last year. And it's kind of like where our mission is to support the childhood and for children to get a childhood. As the data says they're not, it's under threat. Um, however, it's like, what does the modern childhood experience look like. We can only go so far with nostalgia and then pile in on our own priorities at the moment with work and COVID and stress. So where's the margin to understand what a childhood looks like at the moment? So I'd love to understand that and then give us tools to maybe get into the being instead of the doing and a bit of the pausing. Um, also that boys stuff because it's so close to home at the moment. The first book I wrote was Saving Our Children from Our Chaotic World in 2003 because I was already seeing that the childhood that had been considered normal for me was disappearing um, and that was before <laughs> the World Wide Web and the digital um, you know, planet landed. And so um, you know, we can be nostalgic but we also have to recognise in context historically the reason kids spent so much time outside was because lots of people didn't even have TVs, right? You didn't have something that kept you inside. Yeah. One of the big ones too is that we had a much stronger sense of neighbourhood. And, you know, that's one of the things that, you know, um, I've spoken about and shared a lot with the good Queenslanders up there at your play conferences is how do we get neighbourhoods happening? And if there's been a gift from a pandemic in some areas, that's exactly what has happened, that getting locked down, getting kept away from school, closing our playgrounds, kids had to do something um, and not all of them spent their whole time in that digital landscape. So, um, but we, you know, it doesn't matter how many times we bang up and down, Lucas, children being children is, um, which are allowed moments of exquisite freedom and autonomy to be filthy, noisy, unpredictable, um, explorers, adventurers. That is exactly what every child kind of needs because they've got to use all of their senses to make sense of a world that grown ups have created, right? And I feel there's a couple of things that are making that harder in an organic way. Now, the first one is um, that parents today um, uh, have been raised by the punitive parenting kind of behaviorism, which says to get kids to ba obey and do what we want, we need to either punish them or bribe them or reward them. And what the, the science of child development shows very clearly is that's not terribly effective. And what it does is damage relationships. And the big message is mm. that relationship with our key caregivers, but our neighborhood, our early childhood educators, our teaching staff, that has become harder because everyone is twice as busy. They're distracted with phones. Mm. They're distracted with digital devices. There's like just one example. So for the average mum or dad who has a couple of kids in primary school, um, one mum said to me one day that she gets on average on her WhatsApp app messages from anywhere up to um, 20 to 30 different people from the school, the soccer club, the swim club, uh, her friends who've got kids in the same class are asking questions about library books and whatever. So in other words, we're doing that digitally rather than in a real context and not meeting and spending more time at the, at the gate or going for coffee. So does that make a sense of one of those things? Like we're kind of trying to be ultra organised and children aren't good at that. So I think the other thing is the displacement effect of technology 
is another big layer. So you've got neighborhood, you've got, you know, technology that um, it's not just our kids. Yeah. Um, it's, it's parents, it's everyone, right? Um, so that displaces a few things that are about not just how we develop as a social being, how we learn language and communication, uh, how we learn to take risks, mm. um, how we learn to grip things and mm. push things and eat things, because you can't do that with a screen. Yeah. So I guess if you bundle all that together, Lucas, you get an idea yeah. that childhood is different. However, we shouldn't throw our arms in the air and just go, well, this is just how it is, because we know that can have really long-term potential harmful effects on our children in a nutshell. Yeah, absolutely. I've seen it sway in the realm of um, designing play and we've come out of the era of surplus safety. We're coming out of the era of surplus safety um, and, and embracing nature play. And But there is those um, people, when I go in, we're talking about logs and rocks and stuff and they're saying, well, you know, what's the point? Because they told us before when we had rocks and logs that we just had to rubber it. And now you're telling me I need rocks and logs again. What's the point? I'm just going to, I should just leave it until next time you tell me. Yep, it is exactly yeah. that. One of the other things is that when I ask parents, what were some of the risky things that you kind of did when you were a kid? And they often talk about mm. um, scooting down big hills on pieces of wood or cardboard or go-karts with no brakes or building tree houses or rafts, you know, by themselves without a grown-up. And then I say, okay, they're great. Now, are you letting your kids do that now? And there's that just epiphany right there. They go, no, no way. That is way not safe enough. Just rest my case. Yeah, and why? What, what's changed? It's still a piece of cardboard and it's still a grass hill. There's two things. Fear that they're going to get hurt on my watch and I'm going to look like a lousy parent. And the second mm. thing is the judgment. And I think, and, and then I think also we've got to factor in the Insta world a little where, you know, if you're marinated in images of families that have exquisitely well-dressed children who are neat and tidy with no veggie might up their mouth or no dirt on their shirt or... Um, you know, that uh, have got all their safety gear on as they scooter around a neat little track. You get conditioned that that is how play is done by those who have got their SHIT together, right? So we yeah. kind of get conditioned, yeah. don't we, that this is how others, like, and we're, we're social beings, so we don't want to kind of be an outlier. Mm. <laughs> we're a bit like sheep. However, what... The work that kind of you and I have been doing is that we've got so many more now in a mob going the other way so that parents now have a yeah. bit more of a choice. And I love it that when you, um, I think it was a, a news um, article or something or that you did a video about um, that one of the play settings you put up and the parents were going, oh, I love it because that's where we bring the conversation into around our tea tables and our dining tables saying, wow, let's see how it goes. Right, let our kids yeah. have a go. And um, it is, I mean, you know, ferociously um, passionate about our kids actually having opportunities for genuine autonomy, no matter how much parents love them. That there are times that our kids need to do stuff and learn stuff by themselves. And that, um, you know, slipping out of that tree and, you know, grazing a knee um, isn't a sign that you're a lousy parent or that your child's wrong. And I'm not sure how we keep putting that lens on top because I'm sure we've all had a moment as a child where we went, whoa, God, that hurt. But you know what? I go back and do it again because the joy of the moment is bigger than that kind of angst at the end. And we've got a massive increase. Um, and it's not just the last couple of years of a pandemic of increasing in anxiety and mental health issues with our, our children and our teens. And a part of me thinks when you steal childhood, which has those unbelievably exquisite moments of pure joy where no growing up is there, I think it affects our heart and our soul. It's um, the, the head realises what the heart's always known to be true in those moments. Oh, that makes sense. And within our critical mass of messaging and parents, you see that when, when they actually see these things in action and they're... 
their children having that sense of accomplishment and joy, they can, through their senses, they're actually learning the same way as a child in the way that they're going, oh, that makes sense now. I've kind of known that, but now that I see it, we're off down that track. And I, I read some research once about the brain in, in childhood that, so it gets wired to have um, an ability to, what well, we store all our positive memories and our, um, our painful memories in slightly different ways. And they've got research that those children who didn't get those exquisite moments enough, and, and it, you don't, it's not a big, you know, going to a, a, you know, a big fairground or something. It's actually like blocking up that river and flowing down with it or floating boats or it's, um, you know, it's, it's just simple stuff that you do over and over with a bunch of kids so you just fall on the ground either in exquisite laughter or you just get into that transcendent state where you pause into the moment. Um, if you don't have enough of those as a grown-up, the tendency of our brain to actually turn joyful moments into more painful moments. Like we see it through a more painful lens. So we actually turn beautiful mm. things into something negative or we just don't believe that it's, it exists and it's real. So that's the whole notion of authentic childhood is the capacity to store memories that actually trigger our later journeys and experiences as a, a grown-up. And there's this beautiful um, photograph that I took of a um, five-year-old boy in a um, wild space in a school in the southwestern Western Australia because they have a wild space right near an estuary and these five-year-olds go down for three hours, three times a week just to explore and be. And he was standing, honest to goodness, like standing like with his hat on and his little welly boots in the water, really still and looking out. And I thought, I'm going to just watch and I timed him. It was eight and a half minutes before his shoulders kind of dropped and he sighed and he turned and he came back in. And I knelt down next to him and I said, um, you looked like you were looking for something. And he said, yes, I was. And I said, so what were you looking for? He said, whales. Now, the water's not even, you know, 30 centimetres deep. And I said, did you see... <laughs> Did you see? And he said, not today. Now, that eight and a half minutes is a state we call natural transcendence. And that's what little toddlers do when they dawdle or they want to pick up a dead leaf in awe. And what do we grown-ups do, Lucas? Come on, hurry up. I've got to go and get that. Gop, 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 gop. So that's the, that's the simplicity sometimes of yeah. why children need not to have a hurried childhood the overscheduled childhood which seems you know the research shows that extracurricular activities can actually be beneficial for children however too much does the opposite being forced to do things that mum wish she had done when she was a girl yeah without any autonomy of choosing um, and also factoring in that sometimes in winter, who wants to be out in the dark coming home from, doesn't matter what it is, um, does it put pressure on a family so much that everyone gets shouty and yelly because we're trying to orchestrate all these amazing extracurricular things. So at the end of the day, we just hurry up to fill in these spaces that I believe children should have the right to create <clears throat> and fill. And that's that space I find you know, when, when they, they sit on a rock, you can't ponder without a rock or a log. You know, you just can't. So I think sometimes in that earnestness to create opportunities to help our children grow to be the best version of themselves, we steal something that's already doing that. And that's the child's choices and the child's opportunity to do it in their own time. Yeah, and the child's more aware of their needs than we are. And we don't give them credit for that. They're the ones that are living in their body. They're the ones that know their physical confidence for that min even minute of that day opposed to us. And watch how much they grow in like the two a four year old's not twice the two year old. The growth between that period is astonishing. Yet we're trying to be the ones that dictate when we're not keeping up with them. And it's in, it comes down to that individual. There's one size yeah. supposed to fit all children's development. You know yeah. how passionate I am about the fact that um, my two oldest sons, um, who have between them 
four degrees, are they? I can't remember now. You know, I've got lawyers and doctors and radiographers, kind of really well-educated humans in my family, did four half days as five-year-olds in a bush kindy. And they, I think they, I don't know if they ever sat in the mat, but their kindy teacher would often read them a story while they were outside. Um, so they weren't doing yeah. And I, I, I look at that now and I'm seeing, you know, suspensions and expulsions of four and five year old children in environments that are like foreign to them, developmentally inappropriate um, with a system that, you know, has been dreamed up by people who've never read the research. And that worries me because I think what happens then is, is the formation of those mindsets and belief systems about themselves. And Carol Dweck, that work she did, one of the glimpses in her book was that she did research around uh, three and a half to four year olds, around 2,000 of them. And by that age, almost 70% had worked out that they're either smart or dumb or good or bad. So what's happening to those beautiful children, neurodivergent children, boys who need a little bit more time? What's happening to them? in their mindsets i can relate to that wholeheartedly like i've got a little boy doing the year five and um he's sorry he's five going into prep and i think what you summed up beautifully then is when the process goes before the person i've recently felt the guilt of being called to the school because it's his like second week and he's done restore room which is deten it's not detention we're just having a discussion at lunchtime and then the surprise to say when when we went back after the store room, he was really unsettled for the whole afternoon. And how do you, what's your tips for parents, M myself? Because once I start to have these conversations, because it's, it's hard for, it can be hard for being a male and then talking about the, the challenges you're having with your children when your perception is everyone else has got it together except me. And Vanessa, my wife, is the same. Everyone's got it else together. Look at their kids. They're, they're going to school fine. What's wrong? What have we done wrong? and all of these things, what's your tips for parents that are having this um, challenging start to the year? Because so many are having that. Yeah, all right. The very first thing is put that stick down you're beating yourself up with. Seriously. Do you know it's not the child that's wrong, it's a system that's wrong. And even early childhood educators say the same thing, especially the ones that were teaching for quite some time who have just, their hearts are breaking because of the expectations that are now being put on our young children. Now, one of the things I want to touch on here too is that for um, five-year-old children, <clears throat> and it can be some of our girls, it's just statistically more likely to be our boys and also our um, neurodivergent children whose you know, prefrontals you know, working in a very different way, is that we know when children are really stressed, you know, there's the fight-flight response where they act out. Yeah, they say things, throw things, run. That's, and boys particularly tend to need movement to express that. So then what we're doing in, in those moments, we know that child, you know, they look like, and this is one of the biggest things that we've all got to reframe, is that no child consciously chooses to display distress from a stress place. All right? They don't go, right. Now I think is a good time for me to flip out, right? So what it is is that, that that brain is perceiving a threat to survival and it just automatically, and it takes years for us to get better at that. So five-year-old children are still really young and boys are at least 18 months often to two years behind girls at that age of emotional development. So what we're, what we're doing is punishing a child for being distressed and upset and overly unable to cope with their world. Then there's another layer, and this is kind of to do with um, a few messages I was getting from five, parents of five-year-olds, particularly boys, being called up to the school because their child's not listening and not concentrating and not even trying. And I just got really cross again, as though there's an intentionality and there's something your child is doing naughty. And that was when I just had to leap in and explain the second level to distress and overly flooded with cortisol is shutting down. And shutting down means that everything has to, for my survival, I just have to kind of freeze right here. And it looks like you're daydreaming, you're not there and you're not trying. So again, they are both signs of heightened stress. 
And you know what was happening to some of those boys, Lucas? Keep them in at recess and punish them. What are you going to do to their stress levels? What would have happened if they'd been able to go out and play? And so I just, I just had to do it one day. And one of the things that's happened, interestingly, is um, that I've had educators as well saying the school demands I use the reward punishment system where we put their names in red or the traffic light system. And I said, well, there's your problem. So a child struggling to cope with their environment is not feeling totally safe. So we work on first is the safety with the key caregiver, which is a grown up teacher or an, or an aide. Secondly, um, if there's a safe friend, they can sometimes feel a little safer. But once again, if you've got an environment where um, a teacher talks too fast and too quick and the boy can't keep up, that panics him. If you're sitting next to, um, you know, the child who's forever talking in his head and upset, he can't even think, right? You sit, you put the, you know, there are so many things that contribute to the stress level. There's not enough fun. There's not enough singing and there's not enough movement. They're the things that were always there before we were removed to fit more learning in, but the brain can't learn when it's stressed. So my message is advocate loudly. Um, look, there's truckloads of stuff on my website where I write all these things in deep depth because allied health professionals tell me all the time just how stressed our children are that go to them. And the reason sometimes some of these children are getting punished um, for not concentrating and the actual fact they can't hear. They've, they've been diagnosed with blocked ears and things. So we need to look underneath. Is this because they're not feeling safe? Is this because they have a hearing issue? Is this because their sensory processing is, is something that they don't like things hanging too close to them? In other words, we need to get really curious as to what needs are not being met rather than how can we punish this naughty child so that they will start to behave differently? And I think we're in, we're in a paradigm shift and anyone who wants to know more about it, just check out Dr. Mona Delahook's work because she's just written so beautifully and eloquently because she's a paediatric psychologist. Mm. Um, and she has a beautiful book coming out this year, which is, you know, a, for parents and it's just full of gold and it will show you how to advocate for your child. What really worries me though, Lucas, and it's the same with you and your little lad, is they'll say, he'll come good, um, give him more time. And I have worked with some of these boys as, you know, in year three and year four, who are sure they are dumb and they are bad. Because that's yeah. all they've yeah. heard. They've had nowhere in the school system where they've been able to show um, joy and delight they've um, they haven't been able to show they there is something they can do you know that's yeah. that's the whole point is and I mean I have to throw one more curly one in here that last year during the lockdowns um, I'm in New South Wales um, I actually helped with home the home journey of schooling and my five-year-old granddaughter was required now just remember they have a book that they do their letters in Yep, well, she hadn't even got all the way through the book with how to form her letters, right? So that was a clue. Um, and the request was to write a story with a beginning, middle and end with adjectives. I'm a former high school teacher. I struggled sometimes to teach 14-year-olds to do that, right? She hasn't even formed her letters. So what sort of system... Is pushing that down and she is sharp. She's got educated parents, a speechy for a mum. She's very, um, you know, she's a confident little girl. So she's one of the ones who yeah. could do it. Yeah. So what the heck is that doing to the rest? Yeah. And it seems to be like this is a, a very common theme now, but it's also a common theme in years gone by. Like I can relate from my story and that's my motivation to support my son. I remember being in primary school and thinking, well, why can't they see me just as something else, you know? Because I had my learning difficulties. I didn't want to pay attention, but it was just the default was like, I was really intrigued by learning German. And this is a, a beautiful <laughs> illustration of, I don't know why, but I thought German sounds cool. I'd love to learn. I like to do a language. And I remember coming home from school, telling my brothers I learned German. They're like, what are you doing? I'll be that's German mother. They're like, that's not German for sure. Um, but then it was like the teacher said, 
why is he doing German when his English isn't even good? So I got taken out of German and put back into doing extra English classes, which was just so deflating and was like, oh, I thought I found something then. There are three things that drive motivation and one of them is competence, right? You are being yeah. feeling competent in German, which would have flowed across into your other learning. But if you've got children who academics isn't their thing, where else do they show competency? They show it by conquering monkey bars. They show it by helping other children mm. out. There's like, you know what I mean? We just go testing, yep. testing, testing. And the two other things that yep. are motivation is connection to someone else in that environment who cares about me. Mm. So you must've gone on pretty well with your German teacher. And that yep. third one again is I have some control about it, which means I have some choices of which. And for so many boys, the underlying thing in the classroom, having you know taught them for a number of years, is what's in it for me? What? Why should I bother to invest my energy in their skills? Just explain it to me. Now, we don't always do that in primary school. We tend to do it. It's part of the way we set up lessons in secondary. But, you know, they're just wanting to know, so why, why do I need to do this again? Just give me a little bit of a reason so I've got a bit of motivation from within. Because the fact that you should, and I, I demand you do it, isn't always going to float. Yeah, and that's, uh, that comes back to play on how integral that play is um, to be robust and challenging. So when those boys aren't having the victories and girls having the victories, they can go do it in a physical way that gives them this physical chemical response. It courses through their body and it's not dictated to. It's not like, hey, reach for that branch. reach. You do the monkey bars now. Um, you're setting your own goals, your own targets. So therefore your dopamine and all those reward agents are super heightened. And then you go, I guess I can manage to trace an A. Yeah, yeah, that's it. I can still remember there was a bush area in the school that my boys went to, right? Quite a significant bush area, right? It was, mm. um, they are now kind of the main ones now about 36. So you can imagine how many years ago. And um, so this is when you weren't allowed into the bush area till you were in year three. So year threes to year sevens went in the bush area and no teacher would go in there on duty, right? Because they wanted that experience. And I remember there were times that, that my sons would get out of bed like with almost pneumonia because they just didn't want to miss what's going on because there was something going on in the base, you know, that required their attendance. So the motivation was the play. To get out of bed, and I kept saying to them, so by the time I had my second, you know, third and fourth boys, my job was around school says, now, you've got to go to school because there's playtime and lunchtime. You've just got to suck up all this other stuff in the class, but that's why you're going. And it's funny, one of my sons said to me when he was at university, he said, Mum, you remember telling me that? And I said, yeah. And he said, you know, I've built my life around that. I always plan my holidays before I actually turn up, whether it's uni or whatever. He says, I'm always planning for playtime and lunchtime. And I thought, what a beautiful philosophy of life, you know, because there are some, particularly boys, but there are some coming home right now who are going, I don't want to go back. I, I don't, you sit, it's just boring. And of course, sometimes to make the dopamine, which makes the brain learn, you need to have either fun or movement or engagement. And I loved, I love those teachers out there who are able to still do that. Um, I still remember an early childhood educator um, who was teaching five and six year olds who always turned up in a fairy outfit. The whole damn year she was in a fairy outfit. Um, and just the fact she, you know, just you'd see her filling up fuel with a fairy outfit on. It just made everybody feel good, right? Um, and she said the reason she did it was because as soon as they saw a fairy, they all wanted to be there, right? Now I'm not saying that you can imagine everyone thinking that's a great idea but I just loved her passion and she also said to me I tend to sing a lot more I often sing my commands rather than demand and there's yeah. a, this is science out there that shows that when they're singing we often follow it because it's not pushing our autonomy we can actually sing along or the song makes yeah. us feel better it doesn't trigger the stress responses of shutting down or mm. acting out. And I thought, she's a jet. So when they started to, once again, increase all the testing and things, um, she said that, you know, she, you know, at the end of the day, um, it was implied to her that the fairy outfit wasn't in alignment with the new direction of education. And she said, well, um, when the kids tell me it's not okay, yeah, I might consider it. <laughs> 
That is a testimony right there. Absolutely. We're also seeing in current times and through my community and going out and working with educators and centres across the board, the level of anxiety that you're coming across in children at the moment. It's really, it's just upsetting. That's, that's all it comes down to. It is quite upsetting to see young people in this, this time of joy, what's meant to be joy and wonderment and excitement and possibilities and not a care. Like, I'm just feeling like, your cup's full, your cup's full now? Like, of stress now? What about those teen years? And even like friends in my community with teens, like they're getting to overflow now. So what, what can we do as people in the, in the sector supporting our children and parents? Yeah, it's interesting because, um, you know, that, is, that was the premise behind that very first book I wrote back in 2003 was I was noticing it rising in my own classrooms in high school. Mm. And so I took it upon myself, you know, that was before we had brain science that I felt if I could put some pockets of calmness and and relaxation in my classrooms, I think the brain would work more effectively. And so I started those sorts of small things. This is just so far ahead of time. But also, um, I think we need to recognise one thing and that anxiety is a normal human response to a possible threat. Now, sometimes what's happening is our kids are getting threatened by endless testing by developmentally inappropriate curriculums, by parents who are so busy, there's no downtime. And it is one of the gifts. There's no question it's one of the gifts of COVID that there are going to be a lot of kids who can remember sitting on a couch, eating popcorn, watching a movie, instead of doing their schoolwork or or mum and dad doing their work because it just got too much. There was more connection around cooking and growing things and reading books together because they were forced. All the stuff that distracted them was shut down and I'm hoping that we don't have to necessarily race back to thinking that's the best way we need to be so the things that create anxiety is a fear of being out of control and I think any parent the sooner you work out that you're never in control as a parent seriously there's a you know punami going to happen with your toddler you know there's there's going to be um you know they're going to be doing things because they're meant to be stretching and testing boundaries that's all the way through that we don't see that as a problem i think um my challenge around anxiety is that normal anxiety needs to be honored and i want parents to actually talk to their kids about when they're stressed because Mm -hmm. we keep thinking you need to stop (laughs) this no hang on your voice is just telling your kids that you're the one so my challenge is that when you're starting to get yourself really wound up about stuff Um, what I'd probably suggest is it's probably more about you as a child than it is about your child in that situation, but that's another Mm -hmm. whole story. I want you to model, you know what, I can hear I'm a bit stressed right now. I'm going to take myself off to my bedroom to calm myself out. I'll be be back in a few minutes, okay? I want you to model. And so for me, I used to just go out in the garden, you know, and when I got really stressed with my four boys, I'd go for a walk around the block and they were really... They're used to that when mum's, oh man, she's not happy. If I went for 10 minutes, it wasn't too bad. If I went for 20, they usually started to look around picking up a few toys. But if I was gone for more than half an hour, look, they pack the dishwasher, wipe the bench, make their beds. Because they realised that I was really not happy. Okay. So it's an interesting thing that it was great because a couple of them just go for a walk when they're really crabby. So what are we modelling to our children about coping? And that's why the simplest things, and I have a whole lot of these little videos on my YouTube channel under Maggie Soothers, where sometimes that three really big breaths, just, I've actually got one of those little monitors that monitors your oxygen level and your pulse. And I've done this now a few Mm. times when I'm either come back from a walk up a hill or something and I would check my pulse. I want to see how I can lower it with three big breaths. And if you can get the outward breath longer than the inward breath, that's good. And I can lower it if my heart rate's high by up to 15. But if my heart rate's fairly low, I can lower it by at least six beats with just three breaths. So I think we model those things simplistically about being a part of life because that's exactly what life is about. 
Yeah. You know, we're always going to have mm. some stress. However, anxiety on starting school, anxiety around a test, we need to talk to our kids about we feel anxious before a new job, um, a deadline. So that it's not just this awful bad thing, it's actually something that we can identify and then we talk about how can I become braver? And that's, you know, the sooner we can go, I think, you know, sometimes parents do this thing and I've done it. We think what I need to do with them feeling a little bit anxious and struggling right now is instead of just acknowledging, oh, I can see you're finding it a little bit hard for you right now. Instead of that, I see, so don't be silly. It's all going to be fine. You've got nothing to worry about. Well, that is really not helpful because we're not acknowledging that that's exactly where they are, regardless of what you feel. So we need to acknowledge it and see if we can take some breaths together or work out a way of helping them understand whatever that possible threat may be. And then the other one that's a big one underneath it is avoidance. Try to avoid avoidance. That doesn't sound very sensible, does it? But mm. what we know is, um, you know, the child who's really anxious at turning up to the birthday party or, or did want to play soccer but now can't run out in the field, oh, well, I'll just take you home. Let's just, you're not ready for it. No. We urge them to have just two minutes of bravery. So I know you're feeling anxious mm. right now. We're going to go into the birthday party for just two minutes and then you look at me and as soon as you want to go, I'm going to bring you home. Then we're actually encouraging the search for bravery within us. And so often, of course, they'll forget it once they're in there. Um, so can you see they're just some simple things, but we do know yeah. that children mm -hmm. can learn anxiety from their parents. Um, it can sometimes be genetic. It's sometimes triggered by a major mm. life event, like a health crisis or a trip to hospital or someone's sick or someone dies. Um, mm. And we know it can exist beside other things. So again, when we get really worried, obviously go and talk to someone, but you'll tend to find the pressure for kids to manage their emotions before many of them are able to is one of the other big triggers. We're not allowing them to be really upset and discharge it, we still feel we need to shut it down and stop them and soothe them in the middle of it instead of what we now know. It's emotional energy that needs to leave the body, that cortisol's got to be discharged. And if we can create that safe space for it without beating ourselves up or trying to fix it, we're actually helping them learn to regulate themselves, which means they can manage with big feelings. So that also will lower anxiety later in life. I see a default a lot of the time is to, okay, well, the child's uncertain. I'm going to create certainty now. And that's my job to create certainty for the child, which then the pressure of feeling, creating that certainty, yeah, fix it, is just more anxiety for the parent. Um, when we talk about um, dispersing cortisol. Yep, yeah. What's, so the cortisol is the, the, the stress hormone that you know, is supposed to turn up to give us more energy to run away from saber-toothed tigers. Now, when we have it around a test or an exam, we need to explain to our kids there is a gift that comes with cortisol, and that is it makes you actually hyper-focus. It gives you an intensity of energy, so you're not chasing, uh, running away from a saber-toothed tiger. You can get ultra-focused -like focused in your task. And so you can actually utilize it as an energy because it's quite a hot, strong energy rather than always seeing it as a debilitating energy. It's incredibly important. Um, you know, and I, one of the things I want to just throw, um, I was terrified of speaking on stage, um, which, you know, after the last 15 years, nobody would probably believe. And one of the ways that I counteracted it, um, whenever I was heading off to a presentation or something, I used to, because the physiological effects of excitement and fear are the same. Anxiety mm. and excitement is exactly the same in the body. So I just used to tell Steve, my good bloke, God, I'm so excited. I'm just so excited. And you know, after a period of time, I didn't, I didn't have the debilitating side of that because my brain had decided I'm just so excited and excitement gives you energy. So again, anytime say that to your kids as they're going up to do that oral presentation or you're just really, there's a mixture of excitement and fear. I choose excitement as you race off into this new adventure or this new thing or this new tree you want to climb. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, and I'd also just want to encourage the listeners to consider your language around excitement and positivity. 
um, going the other way with your children, they might be in a state of excitement, positivity, accomplishment. And then we swoop in and we're like, be careful. Look out. What about this? Don't do this. And it pushes it into that fear response. So we've hijacked them from excitement, accomplishment to negative cortisol, from which was a positive experience individually. <laughs> And I want to throw one thing out because I've been doing a lot of research around little girls and um, I want to challenge us all to really have a really big think about the conditioning we're still giving our girls around um, being brave and fearless in, in their play opportunities because, um, you know, it's the same as we thought all boys were tough and that girls kind of aren't. It's rubbish. They're all equally as competent, especially in the early years, if we stop putting our conditioning on top of it. And um, my... Um, oldest granddaughter now but when she was about 18 months of age she could climb really well like threw herself out of a cot with a sleeping bag at 14 months so her upper body strength is probably a bit like a nanny's and we were at the um, one of the local playgrounds with a great big climbing frame and she was nearly at the top of the climbing frame and there were these two elderly um, there were couples on either side doing the same as us grandparenting going someone needs to get that little girl down from there she shouldn't be up there and I just basically told her to back off. But there were two things going on there. She was smaller than some of the other children, so therefore she shouldn't be up there. But the big one, she's a girl. She should not be up there. So again, it's the messages we sometimes unintentionally give that can curb our kids from stretching. And we know that play is where they take themselves to the edge of their own fear and then stretch it next time without any coaching from us grown-ups. And I know at times I have to bite my lip because I want to say, oh, uh, be careful. But when we do that, we interrupt the way that their body is already tuning into their body sensations. It's going, no, nah, I think that I'm, I'm okay here. I'm okay here. And I get, you know, I get it. And it all comes from love. You know, all of this intensity of us um of parents comes from love but i you know my big message about resilience is the more that they're able to do for themselves the healthier they're going to grow as an adult and we just sometimes have to hold our knuckles tight do some deep breathing and then celebrate the power of the pause just pause for a moment i've heard the word pop up time and time again from both of us in this conversation, it's the should. The should. How do we move beyond our should for childhood? Um, I just think there's a lovely saying that we, we need to basically call each other out and say we really need to stop shooting on ourselves. Yeah, I really do because, um, you know, there is this place that, you know, where do I see the rules for being a parent um, of my child, you know, um, and I keep saying that to parents who ask me really, I say, you know what, you are the best people to make the decision about your child because your child is a one-off, unique, never been on this planet before, doesn't know, doesn't know about milestones, doesn't know about anything. There's this unique blue chip inside them that has got all sorts of things. Your job is to create the environment around them and the loving support for them to be able to grow to be who they came to be, not the child that you've got in the play group is already running laps around while yours is a blob, not the one whose child who sleeps all night and you're just seriously, you know, can't wait to see you every hour. Do you know what I mean? Is that that's where shooting comes from, is I see some sort of guide, um, recommendation, whatever, and if I don't meet it, then I'm shooting, I'm not doing what I should be doing. And I keep saying there is no. Yeah. Humans, um, we're wired to be social beings and we are wired to take care of the, the ones we love the most and support them. But there is no fixed way of doing it and that every single time yeah. we have to tune into who our child is with what their core needs are right now, regardless of what someone else is telling us but of course that makes it difficult doesn't it Lucas when you've got your five-year-old in a school system that's shooting all over you <laughs> yes, yes. yes yes and then um yeah and you need to have that kind of removal and exhale the bigger pause to say 
And so it's, I, I find myself, I was like, okay, I know what this is in theory, but I'll still find myself going in for that meeting. And then all these feelings are coming up around, oh, I've got to do what they're saying. And we should be, he should be here actually. And the other children, and I'm like, whoa, hang on. Um, it's an easy, it's a slippery slope. Yeah, one of the things I found as a teacher is that when I needed to bring a child in who was um, struggling in some way in my classroom, um, and um, I would, you know, my, my job was for both of us to be on the same side of the fence. Yeah, because it feels like teachers and educators one side, parents, no, we're on the same side with the same goal. And one of the things that even if it was a child who um, <clears throat> had been put in my classroom because they had worn out three other teachers the first thing I did was call their parents in so I could meet them and I would say mm. that we both want the same for your son we want them to do well we want them to grow and so I'm on the same side as you so can we work together you know to to bring out the best in your boy and that when I'm concerned I'm going to contact you but I want you to see if you can help me if you're concerned so that together we're able to meet their core needs and help them be you know, whoever they need to be. Immediately, the parent doesn't feel like there's that fence, right? They feel like they're being heard. And sometimes we start with really small things, like um, quite often with those boys, always forgot their stuff. They didn't have their books. They didn't have their... So, you know, they created a chart with their son that night that they put in their bedroom so that they could help them get organised. And the difference that simple strategy did, amazing. Yeah. Set them up. It's your... What does my wife say? It's our job to set our children up for success, not create their success. She is wise. Wise. Wiser than me. Just saying. That's why I hang out with her. Remember, it's a team. Oh, it's a team goodness. thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. There's strengths and there's there's the handball. <laughs> You're like, this one's you. <laughs> when it comes to more of your amazing books, come on share what's happening can you share about any books that are coming out what's your next plans so um um i thought i was done after i wrote mothering our boys because i thought that was why i was on the earth but i'd written at the back of the book that i was sorry it was such a big book and i wish i'd spent more time talking about boys as teenagers so publisher came and found me and made sure i wrote that book and then i thought i was done but then um with uh particularly 2021 with so much coming up about um, uh, our girls being silenced in the world and, um, you know, our domestic violence numbers going through the roof and um, Chanel Contas and her um, petition and things about horrible sexual behaviour from, you know, influence from porn, I thought, and the numbers that were really struggling in those teen years is just blowing out. And I thought, gosh, I've got four granddaughters who are now aged up to seven, I said, I wanted to really explore how we can build a really solid foundation for little girls because all our mindsets, all our beliefs, a lot of our conditioning is all in place by the time we go to school. So I dived into that, Lucas, and um, it, it, it kind of became another big book because it was so fascinating for me to work out the things that I was told as a little girl that took me years as a woman to undo. Um, you know, because I was the rooster girl who would stand up and speak for others. So I was told I was too big for my boots and I needed to learn to be quiet and I needed to learn to be less visible. Um, and so um, it was, it's great. There are nearly 5,000, you know, people responded to me about the things that they're amazed about with little girls and the things that challenge them the most and how we can unravel that. So I'm extremely excited about my... It is my final research-based book, baby. I'm not doing any more. I'm going to write fiction. Yeah, I'm going to write fiction. It's much easier. Research takes a lot of time. <laughs> so, Girlhood, it's coming your way soon. Excellent. And when it comes to that little tip, how do we support our young girls to... Well, we could go the other way. What is it that we need to instill in our young girls? Okay. Um, really, the big one is... Um, they need to be heard as little girls. So sometimes we get busy and they do, you know, most, this is once again, not all girls and some boys and all of it, but we know that they develop the capacity to make sense of the world emotionally and um, linguistically much earlier than boys. So they actually are capable earlier. Mm. 
that we've got to really sit with them and really hear them even when we're in a hurry. We need to um, engage their amazing memory more often so they feel valued because they've got amazing <laughs> memories. As soon as one of my sons started checking in with his four-year-old daughter, um, uh, reminding her to remind him that he needed to get fuel or to get these four things at the supermarket, um, the amount of tantrums and meltdowns in their home decreased because she just felt much more valued and respected and this is one of the yeah. things we don't realize that um they they don't miss a trick um and they make sense of our adult behavior probably pretty good so sometimes asking for them help to solve problems is setting them up to be problem solvers for life as well we just need to know we've just got to respect the intelligence of our little girls so much earlier and be very careful about some of the words you use around them because they do not forget. There's some hilarious little messages and anecdotes that I've included in the book that just will have you crying with laughter. Um, and so it, once again, it was really a celebration that because um, we don't need them to be well behaved and quiet all the time. We need them to have a voice, but they need to have a voice that isn't using relational aggression. So their voice needs to be something we can coach. And I talk a lot about friendship coaching and emotional coaching because they're the two big areas that mm. we can have problems because, you know, that early childhood educators have been saying we're getting a lot more mean girl behaviour as three and four-year-olds. And yeah. we need to unravel how, what is that about and how do we make sure we have our girls to stay strong without necessarily needing to follow that pathway and why our friendship stuff so complicated. Yeah. Our biggest challenge um, with our seven-year-old last year was all down to girl relationships. And that was the number one across the board. One of the across gifts that board. came in the research was saying that we use that as opportunities for um, exploring and growing rather than opportunities for us to step in and fix and stop it's each time one new one comes up, we work through it together with our daughter. Um, and then they're gonna, it's going to be easy when we're growing up because trust me, it still keeps happening. Yes, it is. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you again. Keep up the yeah. fabulous work. I love your podcast. Even if you didn't invite me, I'd still love it. Thank you so much. Thank you for all you do. And um, thank you for inspiring me as always. You're amazing.